Sabbath turn up in the late 60s. They've evolved out of a blues rock band, very sort of, I think it was called, they were called Earth. But by, by the time they become Black Sabbath and they've gone in to record that, that, that first album, um, I mean, they, they, they were just creating a raw, youthful, angry, energetic kind of rock music, um, which was a perfect blueprint for what heavy metal would become. The whole thing derived from the British blues scene of the mid 60s, which was the kind of music that really grabbed me and my contemporaries. I think when the 60s were ending and the peace and love had evaporated, we were looking at a new decade and Black Sabbath certainly tried very hard to give us a soundtrack for that. Did Black Sabbath invent heavy metal? Of course they didn't invent heavy metal. No. Yes. Yeah, I think Sabbath probably did invent heavy metal. I think Black Sabbath, you could say, actually were one of the, the first real heavy metal bands. It's become such a figure of debate over the last 40 years as to the genesis and birth of the whole movement and environment and how far you can trace it back. But to me, Black Sabbath are the first true heavy metal band. I think probably Black Sabbath invented heavy metal with with the song Black Sabbath. Can we say that Sabbath invented heavy metal? Well, you know, if you say that to Ozzy, he gets very upset because he hates the term heavy metal. Um, I'm not sure the rest of the band particularly enamored by the words heavy metal, but I suppose it's a band that it's definitely, um, that terminology is, is affixed to. No, Black Sabbath certainly did not invent heavy metal, but my God, they capitalized on it. I think they took the medium and, and really honed it and, and very early on made it work, probably better than anyone else had ever made it work. When they turned up, they certainly moved the whole musical genre on tenfold. As a concept um, of heavy, dark music, certainly Black Sabbath were the, the, the very first uh, in the field, really. They were. They invented a style of music that was probably heavier and quite probably louder than was going around the circuit at that time. They invented their own sound, without a doubt. I think where they had their greatest popularity was the fact that you could quite easily copy them. They weren't virtuosi as such. They came up with an entry-level brand of music that obviously got more complicated, but set the uh, template for a lot of other bands to follow. If you listen to the first album, Black Sabbath, you can hear a band that's creating its sound, that's putting the block building blocks together. What was unique about Sabbath's sound was that um, it would probably have scared the hell out of everyone when they heard it back in, back in the day. Compositionally, particularly with Tony Iommi and his very creative way of coming up with endless numbers of riffs and other musical structures that are often put together in quite an uh, uh, interesting and different way. The unique thing about the Sabbath sound, and it always has been through all the ages, is Tony Iommi's guitar sound. Iommi's power chords. I mean, this man just conjured up riff after riff after riff. Tony Iommi sort of refined all the different things that he liked. I mean, he rather like Richie Blackmore in a way. He, he liked classical music and he listened to jazz and sort of, and, and the blues, and, but pared it all down into his style and uh, sort of flowered in, in Black Sabbath. But he was always quite a technical player as well. I'm just a, a guitar player that wants to play and whatever would be something that people would say, well, is unique to me it would probably be the sound and maybe just the way I approach it but how it is I don't know to explain yourself is, is quite difficult. He's quite keen on uh, guitar technique and uh, that was sometimes a bone of contention between him and the rest of the band if the guitar became too dominant too overpowering. <laughs> One of the aspects of Black Sabbath that is highly identifiable and original and unique is, I am told, and I think I recall the story from the man's mouth himself, 
Tony Iommi lost the top of his fingers on one hand. Obviously was very despondent after the, the accident happened and, and, you know, sort of sat at home, you know, this was just a part-time job to, to finance my guitars and, you know, my career is in music and suddenly you're missing the, the two tips of your diddling hand and uh, that is the official terminology for that. And um, he was, as I say, you know, he was very despondent, probably in great despair, to be honest. And apparently the manager from the factory came around with a Django Reinhardt album, stuck it on, played it and said, well, what do you think of that? And he goes, well, you know, it's, it's brilliant. He says, well, that guy can only play with two fingers. So what's the matter with you? Get on with it. I've had a squeezy bottle and melted it down, made it into a ball, got a hot soldering iron and made a sort of hole in it and got it down to, to fit my finger. So I've got this big ball on the end of my finger. Then I sat there all night, filing it down with a, uh, some sandpaper to make a shape of a thimble. Then I put some leather on it, because it wouldn't grip otherwise, it was plastic, it'd just slip off the string of it, put some leather on, uh, which made something like this, which is a plastic and then leather on it. And uh, I used that and follow it. The song Black Sabbath, you hear the graveyard bell, there's a peal of thunder, and in we go with a three-note guitar riff that's probably entered the annals of rock, and quite rightly. There's extraordinary effects on the, the beginning of Black Sabbath, the, the wind and the chimes and the sort of spooky flavour to it all, which was actually their producer's idea. It wasn't the group's idea at all, but uh, that was a uh, set the seal on what Black Sabbath was, how they were perceived as this very sort of dark, macabre kind of band. Six minutes, 37 seconds, starts off with rain, bells, thunder, and just goes into one of the most classical, unique pieces of heavy, heavy music you'll ever hear. Black Sabbath, again, was um, done by just me playing the coming up with a riff and playing it sort of loud. The song Black Sabbath, the title track from their first album. Um, if you had to talk about the birthplace of, uh, of heavy metal, this song definitely contributes, is a big contributing factor. If you want to know about heavy metal, just listen to the title track of the first Black Sabbath album, Black Sabbath itself. That encapsulates everything about heavy metal. The ominous sound effects, the doomy, grinding rhythm. The, the powerful, passionate, rollicking, rolling lead guitar. The riff is absolutely terrifying. It's, it, it, and it really is a scary a riff. Uh, it could have been in The Exorcist. It's that scary. Funny enough, that's a flattened fifth that Tony Iommi's playing. And I bet he didn't realise that that in medieval churches was definitely a no-no. It had a satanic quality to it and satanic implications. The lyrics just scare the life out. What is this that stands before me? And you're like, oh. And the way Ozzy sings it with this, this menace and intent. Black Sabbath, by Black Sabbath, from Black Sabbath, and it should be on the Black Sabbath label. I mean, there's not many bands that can, can do that. You know, your title song is the same as your band, the same as your album title. It's, it's, a, it's, Magic, mate. When Black Sabbath's record company heard Paranoid, 
they knew straight away it was a hit. I think they knew before the band members knew themselves. Paranoid is without a doubt one of the classic heavy metal songs of all time. It's top ten. Paranoid is an all-time classic because you can walk into any jukebox in any bar in most towns and it'll be there. I think this is probably um, Sabbath's sort of uh, their signature tune almost. Two minutes plus of pop metal is probably the best way for me to describe it because it actually is, is a pop song when you listen to it. Very short, very sharp, very straightforward and as soon as you say the term paranoid and as soon as you hear the opening chords you know exactly how it goes. Hit single, remains a hit single, remains timeless. It was quite astonishing at the time because hardly anybody would play it on the radio. It was too heavy. So people that heard it responded to it immediately and went out and bought it. I think when you think of early rock uh, that's one of those tracks that immediately springs into your head. Um, it's just got everything. It's got the vocal, slightly cheeky, um, Aussie, one of Aussie's finest moments. The classic status would be that it came out at just the right time for when music was changing to becoming more heavy. And uh, whenever something is the first, then obviously it's going to be a classic more than it being the best, the first is the most important, really. It wasn't really going to be as a single. We wasn't intending on doing a single. It was, we were in the studio to write an album, the Paranoid album, which was going to be originally called War Pigs, but they banned it from being called War Pigs, so we called it Paranoid. Yeah, we went in to record the album, and in, in the lunch break, I stayed, I didn't go out to eat with the others, I just stayed at, um, stayed at the studio, and just came up with this riff, this Paranoid, and when everybody came back, so let's just, just put this down, so we put it down, and that was it. It wasn't intended as a single or anything, it was just uh, another one for the album. And it's all done and dusted within 30 minutes. The track's finished, you know, written, recorded, and the rest is history. Great things are spontaneous. Um, and I'm sure that if, 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 there, if Sabbath had sat down and tried to come up with a musical formula on paper, and then you know, for what they wanted and then tried to do it, it, it would have flopped disastrously. But I don't think they thought about it that much. They also, oh yeah, let's do this, and went in and did it, and that's why it works so well. The track itself has been a hit first time round, hit in 1980, and in 1995, Kerrang! magazine dubbed it possibly the greatest riff in rock music. So that's not a bad going for a single track that encapsulated everything perhaps that Dark Side of the Moon would a few years later. <laughs> It's real fun to play when I played it with Black Sabbath. It's, it's really enjoyable. And also you know that the crowd is going to go nuts when you play Paranoid. When it's up and running, it's thundering away at you. It's not very long, so I think it's under three minutes. Or if, it's, if it isn't, it's just over three minutes. Then it's, it's gone in a flash. And it just leaves you going, Phew, what the hell was that? The Die Hard Black Sabbath fans, especially the whole brigade that believe there is no Sabbath after Ozzy, um, I think most of them would, uh, would classify it as the defining moment in Black Sabbath's career. It's a great record to this day, it's a great record, it has just a unique feel to it. Whether it's the greatest song they ever did, I wouldn't think so, but it's immediate and uh, I wish I had written it. The unique thing about Black Sabbath was really the way that they all interacted, I think. And I don't mean off stage, I mean on stage and in the recording studio. They just had it on stage as a band. They weren't the best musicians in the world. Um, Osborne wasn't the best singer in the world, but um, as a unit, they, they, were, they were fantastic. They rocked in a, sort of a heavy, heavy way that none of the other bands did. Obviously, as a three-piece instrumental group with Ozzy singing in front, the bass and drums had to give a real kick for Iomi to play over. And particularly because a lot of the songs were not done at the breakneck speed that, say, Led Zeppelin favoured, You'd have to have a rock-solid basis to carry the song. I only knew that he had it, he used it, and Ozzy did the rest.
Sabbath when I was a youngster with, with Ozzy, and, and that was classic. You know, it's an experience to be revered, um, if not musically, just for the experience of watching, watching some loony jump about on stage. There's no one better on stage than Ozzy. I mean, he's an absolute monster when it comes to that. On the stage, he's a superb entertainer, incredible, enthusiastic. Well, I think, uh, conversely, he brought the best out of Tony Iommi. So as a front man, I don't, don't think Iommi was naturally that much of a sort of extrovert. But the fact that he had he was on stage with Ozzy, he could rely on Ozzy to really um, stir the audience up, pump them up, and um, sort of kind of keep the drama up. Ozzy Osbourne is, is a completely off the wall character, so he brings that to his singing. Not technically the greatest singer in the world, but a man who used his, his voice to suit what his band were doing perfectly. If you ever say to Ozzy, uh, you're a great singer, he just laughs and looks very scornful or disbelieving. Uh, I don't think he believes in himself as a singer, really, uh, but he actually is. He has got a very strange, interesting tone to his voice, um, which lent itself perfectly to all the, the early uh, Black Sabbath tunes. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, Ozzy was a great singer. I think Ozzy definitely, he can sing. I think, you know, in, in later years, he, he might, uh, I've lost a bit of confidence in his voice sometimes for whatever reason, but I think at the, the, the end of the day, I think he's got a magnificent voice. And obviously, mad as a bag of spanners. <laughs> Ozzy gave the band its visual identity, its vocal identity certainly, and whether people love him or hate him as a singer, he certainly you know, drew the band out and, and brought them to fame and fortune. I have, of that I have no doubt whatsoever. The original line of a Black Sabbath hit a peak with Paranoid and Master of Reality, two albums that really gave their musical manifesto in a very, very succinct form. By the time they got onto volume four, they jettisoned the original producer, Roger Bain, and with it, they'd taken on extra light and shade using Rick Wakeman, the keyboard player of Yes, to give them a different tone color. The danger would be that after two or three very successful records, then you, they, they know that what they have to do is to pretty much continue with that style, and the audience doesn't really want them to divert too much from that. <laughs> Ecstasy is a rather interesting album. Uh, the, many members of the band thought it was very good. Ozzy actually said uh, it was a very enjoyable album to make. At least <laughs> Tony Iommi enjoyed it because he made it. So uh, I think he felt that it was a Tony Iommi solo album in some respects. But uh, it certainly was a period when the band could kind of forget about all the management hassles they'd been enduring up to that point. And various courtroom battles and uh, all the problems that affect a band on the road, they just kind of forgot about that with technical ecstasy and concentrated on the music. So uh, certainly uh, Geezer and, and uh, Tony Iommi thought it was a great album. Whether Ozzy did is debatable. <laughs> uh, the critics were uh, mixed in their reviews. Uh, Malcolm Dome of Kerrang, who was a top uh, heavy metal writer, thought that uh, the band had lost their way a bit with that album. Technical Ecstasy is a, a disappointment. It doesn't really sound like Sabbath knew what they wanted to do. They seemed to know what they didn't want to do. They wanted to move forward but weren't quite sure how to do it. And it, there's nothing on that album that really makes you feel, this is quite astonishing. This is a great song. Shame it got lost in the whole of the rest of the album. <laughs> They did two albums after Sabotage and, and they, you could clearly see they were a band falling apart. The last two records that they recorded with Ozzy weren't great by a long shot. Some of them wound up on drugs and all the rest of it. And, and Ozzy, Ozzy went, whichever way he went, he went and, and he was gone in a lot of ways for quite some years I think. It just wasn't working, things just wasn't happening. We were ended up recording for 11, well rehearsing for 11 months and nothing was coming up. So we'd come up with plenty of riffs and stuff, but no, there was no enthusiasm. So it just 
it just had to come to an end and uh, we had to have a talk, so it's not going to happen. And um, it was the time when Ozzy went then. I think at that time he was going through a lot of problems himself and, and uh, we needed to sort of get away from each other and we needed to do our own thing, I think. Or he certainly needed to do his own thing. By that time, Ozzy was out of control. He was drinking too much, taking too many drugs, unhappy, and the whole thing was just a mess. And he was fired after that album. Let's face it. Black Sabbath is a great, they are, there's four individuals that make a great band, but they've also got, and this is the word, frontman. They've got one of the best frontman ever to grace a stage, and they've lost him. They've lost him, and what the hell are you going to do? When Ozzy left Black Sabbath, I think it, for a lot of people, it was almost unthinkable that they could carry on. Ozzy Osbourne, of course, was quite literally irreplaceable. You just couldn't find somebody to fill his shoes. Singers are the, the hardest people to replace, and you couldn't get a complete replacement for Ozzy because Ozzy is so unique. Now, Ronnie James Dio, perhaps on paper, wouldn't have appeared like the ideal choice to front Black Sabbath. He'd um, been sacked from Rainbow um, and was toying around with some other musical things and didn't really know what he was doing and they got a call and they hooked up. The strange thing is, somebody reminded me recently, the person who suggested Ronnie James Dio to Sabbath was Sharon Osbourne or Sharon Arden as she was then. Now whether she meant it as a joke I don't know but it was an incredibly piece, incredible piece of planning, incredible piece of suggestion if you want. It would have looked very odd um, and certainly because of Ozzy's strong image and, and, and the way that image was linked to Black Sabbath, the band. But you only have to listen to Heaven and Hell to know that it is a marriage made in heaven. It worked great. I mean, straight away it was like life into the band again by just bringing somebody new in. And the, the sparkle was there again. It was really exciting. Everybody was like really ready to go again by whom somebody put something into it. I don't think that there was a better choice of singer. I don't think anybody else could have gone in and pulled off walking into Aussie's shoes as well and as creatively and with such a bombastic approach as Ronnie Dio did. Some of the things we had already written uh, when Ronnie, before Ronnie came, uh, so his involvement was, was good really because he came up with a few other ideas to add to the songs. I think it was a risk for him to bring someone in who sounded like he did because he wasn't the Aussie replacement. He was clearly going to make the band a very, very different band. Of course the way he'd sing, he's a totally different singer to Ozzy, so the way he'd approach things was a lot more operatic if you like, so it, it helped a lot for us. He was a good choice but he wasn't Ozzy Osbourne, never really wanted to be, he was Ronnie James Dio. It was a high point perhaps Perhaps the highest point since Master of Reality. I think Heaven and Hell is the best Black Sabbath album. I think it sounds the best. I think the songs are absolutely amazing. Ronnie James Dio is one of the greatest rock singers of all time. Um, and almost anything he lends his voice to has a very classy sort of sound to it. He clearly had a lot of influence in the band, in the writing, the sound. He transformed Black Sabbath. And, and I think he transformed it from a dying band um, into a quite a vibrant, musical entity. The first kind of taste of any people would have got for Heaven and Hell, Neon Knights was the first single. As an introduction to the band I thought it was fantastic because I mean it's it's so dramatic and it moves along at a great rate of knots. They went from being more of a sort of straight ahead metal band to they developed this more kind of like more of a heavy rock sound, very melodic, still very heavy as well um, over the whole album. But Neon Knights is a good example that you know they, they they were heavy, but very melodic, and evidently it was going to work, and it was going to, and it worked very, very well for them. Guy Young was a very clever combination of the best of Rainbow and the best of Sabbath. Guy Young was a good song, one of the better ones from the Heaven and Hell album, and I think it worked because. Um, it was, it was vibrant, it was fast, powerful, um, and fantastic vocals from Ronnie James Dio. It's very difficult to pinpoint what would be the greatest song of, of, of that era. 
but that's got to be in there definitely, Die Young. Fantastic song. If you're talking about a Black Sabbath anthem from the Ronnie Dio era, if you're talking about a, an anthem from the 1980s, this is it. This is it. Heaven and Hell comes out at the height of resurgence of interest in heavy metal with, through the new wave of British heavy metal in the UK. And Heaven and Hell comes out and is an instant hit. I'm a great believer in a band with the original lineup is the only band that can exist. And although it was slick, it was professional, it sounded great, it looked great, it just wasn't even close. This guy has created a different, slightly different sounding Black Sabbath, but one that's no less appealing. He brought baggage with him, he was a known quantity, but he certainly did manage to add to the Sabbath legend without taking too much away. Ronnie James Dio was a good choice to, re to replace anybody or to be himself. But he sure as hell wasn't Ozzy Osbourne and didn't try to be, and that about him I admire. A lot of people have slagged Tony Martin being in Black Sabbath, but I think if you look at the material that he recorded with them, for consistency alone, he was probably better than anyone. I went to see them again, I went to see them at Hammersmith Odeon with him. And if I'd been disappointed with Black Sabbath with Dio, I was almost suicidal when I walked out of that gig. On stage, Tony Martin was a very static performer, but he had a great voice. I mean, a really, really good voice. Technically, he was a very good singer and might have been the best that Sabbath could have got. Tony Martin came up, who was a great singer, I thought. Superb. I think he's a great singer, and he, said, he did sound very much like Dio in, in, in many of the songs that he sang. So the identity that Sabbath had built up with Ronnie James Dio, they certainly didn't want to let that one go by the sound of it. And I think with Tony Martin, it, it did, it worked very, very well. From a flash, evil night, when a black flash of light, can the crucifix have to the ground? Eddie Scoss was the beginning of an upswing in the fortunes of Black Sabbath, certainly the post Aussie Black Sabbath. Headless Cross is, is Tony Martin's finest hour with Black Sabbath. I thought Headless Cross certainly had its moments. I think the song Headless Cross, again, is another Sabbath classic. They create a, a very bombastic, loud, um, heavy rock album. I think it laid down a marker. It wasn't the best post Aussie album, but it was among them. And I think it showed the way that Sabbath were going to try and progress through the 80s and into the 90s. Do you see how we share all the perfect grace? Does it make you laugh? Put a smile on your face. Tony Martin did well, he sang on one really good Sabbath album, that's The Headless Cross. I personally haven't got much time for the music that's on tier and cross purposes. You're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, which is sort of apt for Black Sabbath. But, <laughs> you know, if you do something different, oh, well, it's not like Sabbath used to be. And if you try and sound exactly like how they were, well, why don't they do something new? You know, you, you almost can't win. When people talk about Black Sabbath, and when they always seem to miss out on Tony Martin, and I think it, I, I think it's a great shame because many Sabbath fans have enjoyed the albums that he's done over the years. Tony Martin's certainly been underrated by a lot of people as a singer, and I think when we look back, we'll find that the albums he appeared on with Sabbath, although not the best-selling and certainly not the most critically applauded held together as a body of work that he certainly has no need to be ashamed of. I think Into the Void is one of the classic Sabbath songs. To me it's up there with Paranoid and Black Sabbath and the track itself. Bill Ward, the drummer, feels that Into the Void was Sabbath at its absolute height and he's saying that, who are we to argue? Just from the off, from the very first opening riff, you know that it's a head-banging track, and I think that's the appeal. 
Um, no mystery about it, you know, heads down, no nonsense, boogie, and it's going to be, you know, head banging all the way. It was an interesting concept Giza Butler coming up with that he wanted to jump into a rocket ship and escape what's going on on Earth. And what's interesting about this song is that it's, um, the vocals are very sparse, there's not a lot of vocals on them, and uh, in general Sabbath tracks feature vocals heavily. Um, there's very little vocal and that works great, again it's showing, displaying Tony Iommi to be um, a really, really fine guitar player. He did gravitate towards the Dio era songs and that was really because he was young enough to have been influenced by Rainbow as well as Black Sabbath themselves. He could tackle pretty much anything and I think Mob Rules was definitely grist to his mill. I think Tony Martin was such a proficient singer, still is such a, such a proficient singer, I think he could actually cover most of the Sabs, probably with the exception, ironically, of, of um, Ozzy. I think Sabbath fans often question Tony Martin's ability to deliver certain songs and um, the song Children of the Grave, I'm afraid he doesn't quite get to grips with it. Most Sabbath fans would definitely associate Children of the Grave with Ozzy Osbourne. But of course he didn't write the lyrics, it was Geezer Butler's idea to tell us that if we carry on polluting the planet, then we're not going to be able to live here at all. Now that message was still certainly relevant when Tony Martin got hold of the song, but as something that was so indelibly tied in with Ozzy, perhaps that was a challenge too far. It's a great song, it's in classic Sabbath mould, um, the dark side coming in sort of dark and moody, and it just sounds a little bit bland, um, Martin's vocals over the top of this, this track. Uh, so I can see the point of the, the die-hard Sabbath fans, early era Sabbath fans who, um, who question Tony Martin's ability to sort of cover material such as this. Tony Martin's a very, very good singer and, and his role in Black Sabbath should never really be sort of undermined. Tony kept faithful to Tony Iommi's vision of what Black Sabbath was. And that is the vision that the fans have been following throughout the years. Some people say that the Tony Martin years were underrated. I don't think they were at all. I just think they were maybe misunderstood, not quite as, um, as impactful as, uh, as Ronnie James Dio and obviously Ozzy. Uh, I, I mean, I still, I'd, I'd listen to uh, a Black Sabbath album with Tony Martin on it. Yeah, I would. And I would enjoy it, and of course I have, and I've played it. But there's always that thing in the back of my head. Where's the voice of Oz? Where's the voice of Oz? Make a joke and I will